um, hosting today's session. Welcome to the Alive Mental Health Research Virtual Cafe Translation Conversation. We're really excited to have Laura Hayes and Nicola Ballenden here to talk about um, Haven Homes. Um, before we get going, um, there's just a couple of things I'd like to run through um, to tell you a little bit about the network and what's been happening and what is coming up next. First, I'd like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people who are the traditional custodians of this land and pay respect to elders past and present of the Kulin Nation and extend that respect to other Indigenous people present today. I'm actually beaming in from Launceston, Tasmania, so I'd also like to acknowledge the Palawa people of Lutruwita. We also recognise the lived experience within the room today and that we speak honourably and respectfully about ongoing emotional distress, experiences of trauma and mental health and the work of caring and the experience of care within this context. So um, do take care of yourselves today um, as you listen to the talk. So just a bit of an update about um, the Alive uh, National Centre. Uh, we've got some fantastic numbers on this on the screen. We've got 186 lived experience research collective members, 205 next generation researcher network members, nearly 2,000 co-designed living lab members, and 63 members of the Alive Collective. And for anyone who isn't already a member of the network, I'd encourage you to join. Um, lots of fantastic resources uh, and supports and opportunities with the network. This is our 2023 pocket map uh, for mental health research translation. I'm not going to go through all of it today. Um, it's available on the website, but there has been some updating since last year um, and just gives a bit of a, a background and an approach for the centre um, and, and how the, the network seeks to tackle some, some pretty big issues. And just an overview of where we all are. So um, we've got representation from across the country. Um, we've got a fair bit of representation in Victoria, um, but really pleasing to see every state um, is represented at the moment. Um, and the fantastic thing about this network being um, virtual and across the country is that it's accessible for people like me, who's a rural uh, regional researcher to link into. Um, and a very supportive network for uh, connecting and building capacity and, and uh, seeking opportunities. Uh, I'm one of the co-leads here with the Next Generation um, Research Network, and these are the other fantastic co-leads. We've got a mix of PhD students and mid-career researchers. We all get together quite regularly um, uh, to plan events um, and uh, to connect. Next Wednesday, you are all welcome to attend our um, Delving into the Early Career Cosmos Q&A. Um, we've got some panel members um, that can give some uh, tips and experience about how early career, career researchers uh, can progress in mental health research, looking at grant opportunities and funding. So please do feel free to register. Um, anyone can attend, as I said, for next Wednesday at 10.30 a.m. We have uh, some funding schemes that are uh, due for closure next, uh, it's September 1st, I can't remember which day it is, uh, but in about a week, we have four early career researcher seed funding awards up to 20,000 per person. And we also have four mid-career research awards, uh, more for professional advancement and career expansion. So PACE awards up to 10,000. There's a link there if anyone's interested in looking at that funding scheme. I do believe you do need to be a network member in order to apply for those funding schemes. We also have our quarterly Alive National Centre Forum um, that is coming up in September. Um, anyone is welcome to attend this, uh, but you do need to, to join the network, which is for free, in order to access the link. So, um, and at this forum, there's a presentation of one flagship uh, project and one short-term project and then time for lived experience research collective leads um, to provide input after each presentation so it's a really fantastic opportunity to see what's happening um, on a on a, a broader level so uh, I'd like to introduce our fantastic speakers today 
Um, what we what we might do, because there's a fair few online, if you've got any questions or comments, if you could just pop them in the chat down below and we can circle back at the end um, for questions. But I'd like to introduce Dr. Laura Hayes, who has expertise across a range of psychosocial interventions, such as supported housing, which can underpin recovery, an interest in family and care inclusion, and a long-term interest in program evaluation and project lo program logic approaches to outcomes mapping. We also have Nicola Ballenden, who's the Executive Director of Research Advocacy and Policy Development and has held senior research roles across the not-for-profit sector, providing research policy and service development and strategic communications expertise in health, welfare and homelessness organisations, including the Australasian College for Emergency Medicine, the Brotherhood of St Lawrence and Launch Housing. So um, I will now hand over to um, our fantastic speakers. I'm just going to stop sharing. So there we are. Thank you. And you're all right to yep. pop you take over. Here. I'm not sure whether I need to put myself on different view. Oh, Laura's. Here we go. Excellent. All right. Thank you. Um, so Good afternoon, everybody. Lovely to meet you. Um, I'm Nicola Ballenden. Uh, uh, as Heather said, uh, I'm the Executive Director of Research Advocacy and Policy at Mind Australia. Um, we and Laura Hayes, Dr. Laura Hayes, is our um, Research and Evaluation Manager at ha at um, at Mind. And today we're going to be talking to you about. Um, the Haven model, so giving you a bit of a um, overview of what the what the model is, which provides safe, secure, and long term housing through the Haven Foundation. We're going to look at the actual. We'll have, we've got a video of the facilities. Um, we're going to talk about some resident stories, um, and then finally some of the um, mines had a long standing investment in understanding more about the housing, the intersection between housing and mental health. So we've invested in um, a range of research projects over the years. So we'll talk a bit about that and we'll talk about some of the new findings um, that have come from really looking at uh, some of our um, operational data about the Haven residences and the outcomes for uh, the residents in those facilities. So I might also then go on now just to acknowledge um, that I'm joining you on the lands of the Bunurong people and I'd like to pay my respects to Elders past and present. Um, Mind also has an inclusion statement. So I'd like to say that, um, that we value the experience and contribution of people from all cultures genders, sexualities, bodies, abilities, spiritualities, ages and backgrounds, um, and that we recognise people with lived and living experiences mm -hmm. of mental health challenges and value their expertise, strengths and skills. So thank you very much for that. So MIND is um, one of the largest providers of community-managed psychosocial services in Australia or mental health supports. Um, and we've got a range of residential, mobile outreach, um, centre-based and online services. Uh, we're also a leading employer of people with lived experience of mental ill health. Um, and hopefully people have seen Mind's uh, lived experience strategy that we give a little plug for that because we won a prize at the FEMS uh, conference last week. Um, and that we're one of the largest um, providers of specialist community mental health um, uh, housing, and we are a registered NDIS provider. Thanks, Laura. Um, so the Haven Foundation, and I'll go a little bit later uh, into how the Haven Foundation came into being. So they are part of the Mind um, group of um, of uh, companies. So. We, the Haven residences are unique. So the Haven Foundation does the community housing part, I'll just say that, and MIND provides the support into the, into the, um, into the homes. So um, it's a unique and integrated model of housing with support 
um, for people with enduring uh, mental health concerns. Uh, there's a there's 24-7 support from on-site staff. Um, and we currently have six uh, Haven residences in South Yarra, Frankston, Geelong, Laverton, Marupna and Epping. Um, five more are currently being built in Pakenham, Durham, Ballarat, West, North, Bendigo and Seymour. Um, thank you, Laura. So this is a little video of our... Um, the Haven for the mom. Thanks very much. So um, the Haven model uh, combines um, two, the two ingredients, which is social housing. So really um, long-term housing, if that's what people want, there's no time limit in terms of um, how long people stay in a Haven. Um, and it's, it's absolutely also up to them to move out of the Haven. Um, so it, 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 for some people, um, we've got a number of really quite long-term residents and um, as you'll find out for some, from some of the stories from people that we work with, we've also had people um, who've moved out and um, live more independently now and don't require the sorts of supports that are offered within the Haven. So this diagram kind of um, is a very high level overview of what we're um, seeking to the support we're trying to provide within the Haven. And it's it's probably worth noting that um, we do recovery focused support at Mind because that's our kind of mission and philosophy. It's not really supported within the NDIS, which is coming very much from a disability type of focus. Um, so that is something that we do because we're committed to doing it, not because we're funded to do it. And that has um, that sometimes requires some compromises in I, how we staff the havens and I guess what we're able to do, but we do the best, um, the best that we can. So what we do is, um, uh, sorry, just go back, I'll talk to that. <laughs> I'll talk to the diagram if I could, Laura. Well, there we go. So there's um, quite careful planning before people move into the Haven um, for them to have a look at it, decide whether it's right for them um, and um, what kind of supports that they might require. Um, a lot of support around the moving in and we do find the six months of establishment can be a time when people need um, higher levels of, of support and um, more support um, around building relationships with other residents and becoming kind of part of that um, community. And then after that, it, it kind of reduces a little bit. Um, so people have their own tenancy agreements and support to maintain that tenancy um, but at the same time they're also being supported to build capacity and support with activities of daily living. Um, so one of the big uh, points of focus of uh, Haven is really encouraging people <laughs> to get out of the Haven and go and connect with the community 
Um, and also what we've found is people do, um, particularly over time, find their own people within the haven and um, our friends within the haven and then they use that to go out and engage with the community more broadly and that is something that we try and support. In the very early genesis of the Haven models, the, Haven, the family participation was really key and it is in a number of the Havens, but not all of them. And not all people in Haven um, do maintain that really close relationship with, um, with their families. But where that exists, we do um, try and support that. So we do also work to support people's independence and um, keep you know, encouraging them to think about whether, um, you know, if they're happy in, in the haven, that's great. And if they'd like to um, move into different forms of housing, we try and support that as well. Thanks, Laura. I've probably covered what was <laughs> what was in the other, the other slides, but the tenancy and the support are separate. Um, so they have a secure tenure. Um, with clear tenancy obligations and they need to pay rent from their income. Uh, it's a very home-like environment. We've uh, co-designed it with people with lived experience. As you can see from the video, the quality of the building is um, very good. They're quite new. The facilities are nice. Um, and we've put a lot of focus in the balance between um, independence and then community of people choose that. Thank you. Next one. Um, so the residents and the staff work together on whatever that person's chosen goals might be. Um, or we, we do have quite a large lived experience uh, peer workforce at MIND and all of the havens have at least one peer worker. This has been quite hard to deliver because um, uh, the level of the disability support worker that is funded through the NDIS is lower than what we like to pay our peer workers, but um, we, we do still try and uh, fund that into all of the havens. Our residents get uh, immediate support when they need it, so there is a um, staff member that stays overnight um, and they are given support around building capacity and independence. Thanks, Laura. Um, so we do aim to try and create opportunities for education and employment, and um, we have had some quite good outcomes from that. Also, a lot of psychoeducation around helping people to um, manage their own symptoms and support around medication use, although we, you know, we're a psychosocial support, not a clinical support. And um, one of the interesting things that kind of come from looking at our practice data is um, how many of the residents have goals around improving their physical health, but also how many of them really have pretty um, uh, serious struggles with, um, with physical health um, issues and chronic illness, uh, such as diabetes um, and a range of kind of other um, physical health problems so supporting people around making sure they go and see their GP that they for example know how to use their asthma puffer is another um, component of what we're delivering thanks Laura um, so yeah as I said family members are welcomed um, and we do run some social activities um, and we try and build that relational recovery supporting um, family relationships where that's um, where the resident wants that obviously thank you next one um, so we have found that um, a lot of people who move into a haven prior to that have really struggled with isolation and loneliness um, it can take people a little while to kind of come out of their shell but they very many of them um, have reported that they um, enjoy having peers with whom they can relate um, on their own terms. So they're not in a congregate setting, they have their own um, 
separate accommodation, but there are always people to talk to. So a lot of people have really found um, that helps them to feel less lonely, to feel more connected and less isolated. And that, of course, helps with their um, mental well-being as well. Thanks, Laura. Um, so we've, yeah, as I said, we've found that it increases um, independence and capacity. We are, um, there's a very long-term evaluation being conducted uh, by La Trobe that's due early next year. Um, so there'll be a range of other findings coming from that. We're not going to go into too much detail about that at the moment. We're looking at um, some of the, just presenting the model and talking about some of our operational data, but, um, you know, these are some of the themes that are emerging from the evaluation and from our own experience of um, working with people in Havens. Thanks, Laura. Um, and we, we have had also a lot of um, family members say to us, this is great. I feel like I've gone back to, um, you know, being a mum or a sister or a brother to, um, you know, to the person. I don't feel like I'm their carer. I feel like we're equals again and we can just have fun together and have that family relationship, not the carer relationship. So um, we get some and good feedback from the carers as well. Thanks, Laura. So um, here are some resident stories and we have um, these residents have kindly agreed to share their stories with us. Um, so this is Sean. Um, Sean was hospitalised 122 times in one year before he moved into um, Paven Geelong. He had a lot of different struggles. Um, so he probably actually saying he was hospitalised 122 times isn't necessarily, um, he wasn't necessarily admitted all of those times. Some of those times he just went to the emergency department. Um, but he was homeless, uh, had alcohol issues, fractured relationships with his family and um, some unstable mental health supports. Um, the... Safe housing offered with Haven has really been a turning point for him. Um, he he uh, is not drinking alcohol or, or taking drugs anymore, um, relying much less on his NDI support worker who he, he called a lot of times a day. He's had just one um, admission since he moved in. A really big part of Sean's journey has been um, re connecting with his culture and um, with the local Aboriginal co-op and the men's shed um, that's run by that local co-op and really um, building the community both within um, the Haven and through the, the connection back to his culture and the Aboriginal growth in the local area um, so that that's been a really excellent um, outcome for Sean. Um, okay, shall we go to the next one? Um, and this is this is Heather. Um, so Heather had a really um, had like a twenty year battle with a serious mental health issue, um, and she. Um, which was an eating disorder, in fact, um, and she was one of the first re residents in Haven, Geelong, and she, um, you know, she notes that even though when she went into the, oh, sorry, it's Haven Frankston that she, she went into, she, she notes that when she went into the Haven, um, she, um, uh, the worker there actually didn't, know a lot about eating disorders so she didn't have that specialized knowledge but she was a really fantastic listener um heather was move, able to move into a supported environment um and change you know that over time really changed um her well-being and um she has since um, when she when she was kind of giving us, I'll just read this from Heather because I think it 
it was it's really pretty inspirational when we were telling her we were using her story. She said, I'm writing this reflection from my new apartment. I signed the lease to a fully independent private rental and I celebrate my recovery on the first night in my new home by having Uber Eats delivered for the first time. The significance of this meal and the journey it represented was perhaps more delicious than the, di the dinner itself. And she says about the Haven, at the Haven I had my independence yet also knew I had strong shoulders to lean on, which without a doubt enabled me to leave behind decades of illness and numerous inpatient admissions. The Haven is a little community and I often find myself thinking about my friends. Um, and this year I will submit my PhD thesis and begin working part-time as a teaching associate at Monash University. It's my wish that others can have the opportunity which Haven has afforded me. So it's a really very inspirational um, story from, from Heather. She's a little bit unusual, I'd have to say, in terms of the profile of the residents in the Haven, but when everybody does have their own um, quite different story to tell. I'll just go on to the next one, I think. Laura? Thank you very much. So a bit more background about um, the Haven Foundation. Um, which is started in 2005 by a group of um, carers and families who wanted safe long-term housing um, for their family members. So it was um, first known as, thank goodness they changed their name because this is not a, very, <laughs> not a very catchy name, the Interdependent Homes for People Needing Assistance, um, and then evolved into the Haven, Haven Foundation. And in 2019, the Haven Foundation became a subsidiary company of Mind Australia Limited when we took over running the South Yarra Haven. And then we have been fortunate enough to win funding for a number of new havens um, in Victoria. Um, we've also um, got one being built in South Australia and two in New South Wales. And I think after that, it is over to you. Thank you, Laura. Thanks. Thanks, Nicola. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit more about the research that MIND has done um, in relation to mental health and housing and a, a bit of um, a recent, some recent findings that we've made. Um, so in 2019, MIND and Ohuri, um led some research called Trajectories, which was around uh, housing and mental health. And um, it, uh, I suppose we found that there was... Of, what we all sort of really intuitively understand, but perhaps we don't see it in the evidence base so much, is that there's a um, complex interplay between mental health and stable housing, um, and that um, there's some um, they're able, um, we're able to sort of find uh, precise sort of uh, numbers around this. So, for instance, being diagnosed with a mental health um, condition can increase the likelihood of a forced move by 39% and the likelihood of financial hardship for people experiencing psychological distress um, increased by 89%, and financial hardship can often mean uh, housing challenges about and housing stress to um, emerge. Uh, so the complex interplay um, between housing instability and mental health was identified, and of course there's some, it's interwoven with a lot of other challenges like stigma and loneliness and isolation. Uh, inadequate access to required supports in er, you know in areas where housing is more affordable low availability of suitable housing opportunities that um, include supports to maintain tenancy uh, so I mean housing's a uh, access to suitable housing which is you know according to your needs or your choices is a human right and um, safe and secure housing is the foundation for mental health recovery so at mine, we think it's really um, very important and pivotal. Um, and the trajectories research also identified five key um, patterns in terms of housing and mental health. Um, some people are excluded from help, um, which includes access to secure housing and to mental health support, and, and sometimes not um, fully realising that, that those kind of supports um, could exist for them. Some people are stuck without adequate support 
So it's enough perhaps to get along, but never enough to flourish and certainly not enough to support recovery. Um, some people, it's a cycling trajectory, uh, can be a downward spiral every time uh, support's withdrawn again. And that's sometimes quite related to the structure of our mental health system and our, and our housing service system, which is uh, quite discontinuous. A lot of um, people falling through the gaps when they're, when they're tr transitioning to different parts or different types of supports. Um, and uh, more positive is the stabilising trajectory, number four, which is accessing secure and safe, um, appropriate housing um, and ongoing support to enable recovery and um, support housing stability. And then finally, um, the optimal situation, which is that well-supported trajectory, enabling recovery in the housing of your choice, um, which supports independence and capacity to um, achieve your a person's recovery goals. And, uh, you know, with our Haven residences, we, we really aim to uh, support people to be able to move from uh, trajectories one, two, and three and uh, access through um, and, and become, gain, gain a um, stabilising trajectory or even a well-supported trajectory. Um, and I suppose Haven can offer um, some key circuit breakers that enable people to move forward. Um, that's uh, the access to secure affordable housing where they feel safe, there's support to maintain the tenancy as much as just daily support, connection to a trusted worker, and I think that's exemplified in, in Heather's story, help to manage distress and sort things out just be, beyond um, just organising medication, help to deal with trauma. Um, that's an issue for many of our clients and residents. Um, and the social support and the community connections that are clearly part of the model and early intervention when things go wrong. And that makes a big difference too. So in um, general, in the general support of housing literature, um, there's demonstrated many in, um, really solid outcomes for uh, residents. It reduces healthcare costs, it decreases hospitalisation, increases wellbeing, increases occupational balance. So that's people working or, or having activities uh, to their, in a way that works with their the context of their whole life and, uh, and follows their own choices, increases social inclusion and provides a stable place, space for, for recovery. So it's a, it's a very um, valuable um, support for people and really um, will support sort of global, um, uh, you know, imp improvement across a wide range of person's life areas. Um, and we also know from the research some of the keys to satisfaction and effectiveness of, our, of supported housing, and that's being able to choose housing and support that suits your needs and preferences. It needs to be individualised, not institutionalised. Um, it's people need to live in housing that's actually of good quality and appropriately designed. Uh, housing needs to encourage community integration. And um, some people, of course, prefer what... Um, literature calls floating supported housing, which means um, living in a more ind independent tenancy with support via um, assertive outreach. But it's not one size fits all. So different types of supported housing um, are, uh, suit the preferences of, of um, different people. Um, but, you know, because we find, of course, obviously a lot of people coming to us to uh, join a Haven residence, they're preferring a more communal setting. Um, the research doesn't tell us what type of housing works best for different groups, but I think um, most people are quite able to <laughs> express their own individual preference and, and um, uh, uh, determine what's best for them. Uh, the challenge, there's been quite a bit of, even though there's been uh, quite a bit of research done in the area, there's definitely challenges in doing research um, around supported housing. Um, the evidence is stronger for people who are um, have been previously been homeless, um, but there's clearly a high overlap with um, between people living with mental health challenges and homelessness population. So that the um, research sort of um, can be understood more broadly. Uh, 
obviously challenging to do randomized controlled trials. Um, it, you know, housing is such a substantial support. It's really hard to sort of randomly offer people housing or not in a trial. Um, and if we do perhaps an alternative approach like quasi-experimental uh, research, then sometimes it can be tricky to um, uh, address confounds. And just sort of, I'll just an example of um, the challenges of recruiting to a randomised controlled trial. Uh, Helen Kalaspi, who um, was running a very large um, house, supported housing research program in 2019 and screened over 1,400 potential participants and only 17 consented to participate in the research. So that was like um, obviously a pretty ch challenging research situation. Um, and when they looked into the um, the reasons why this happened, the main obstacle um, was um, staff and service user preference um, that they wanted a particular type of supported housing. They didn't want to be randomised to here or there. Um, and the staff also felt that the it um, compromise their professional judgment to just be random for being in a um, circumstance where their clients were just going to be randomly assigned to some different different sort of housing intervention. Um, so mirror designs. So when we look at um, a person before and after moving into uh, supported housing, could, can be a way forward, um, and that's an approach that we've taken with a bit of research. I'm going to talk about now. Um, so that the Mirror designs sort of can let people be their own controls. Their, their um, uh, whatever the outcome was before they moved into the housing is compared to how they're going on that outcome when they're uh, living in the housing. So this is what we did. We looked at hospital uh, stays in length of days from the 12 months before they moved in, and then we compared it to a 12-month period after they'd moved into Haven. Um, so we had data for 29 uh, residents, 7% of whom were First Nations, 7% were born overseas, 10% uh, were working, um, about half, half male, female, uh, three years average stay and um, average age of 46. And this is what we found, that there was actually an 86% reduction in days hospitalised from before they moved in, which... The average was 53 days in hospital in the year before they moved in, and it, the average um, number of days in hospital was uh, just over seven um, at, in the year after they moved in. So that was um, that was statistically significant, but um, you can see that that's actually a, a huge difference. Just the numbers there are um, pretty striking. So clearly this gives our, um, our residents much more time for their own recovery and living their life. Um, it um, means that they um, uh, obviously reduced hospitalisation represents, is going to represent um, better overall mental health uh, and reduced hospitalisation means um, stronger uh, community connections, um, more time for their building their living skills and having living their lives. And for the bean counters, that means there's cost offsets. Uh, it means um, that we, you know we, that uh, people living at Haven is actually saving other parts of the health system a substantial lot of money. Um, for instance, uh, the Australian in Institute for um, Welfare and Health calculated uh, hospital costs for acute mental health care at over thirteen hundred dollars a day. So if we multiply that out, if we've saved 45 days of hospital um, on average per resident, um, multiply that out by 1300, that's around $60,000 a year. Um, and I, it just seems um, just optimal that we're spending that on supporting something positive like people's stable housing than um, just uh, trying to um, mitigate um, their, their health, their, their um, uh when their mental health is un, um, under the challenge. Um, some of the mechanisms for this could be that um, people just have uh, just much less mental health challenge because um, their, their mental health improved while being in a stable housing situation. 
just improvement in functioning and better recovery. There could be the effect of more bonding and social support, uh, better access to treatment earlier in relapse, uh, reducing its severity, and also able to offer extra support, extended support for the person um, staying in their home rather than having to go um, outside to hospital. And I think this is quite a robust finding because research has um, other research, which has looked at um, hospitalisation for people in supported housing, has found very similar results. Um, we've got the results. I think Hanrahan was uh, the US and Melanovsky was a US study. Uh, Lee was an Australian study. Adamus was Swiss. And Nordentoft was a very big study, you know, epidemiological um, in Denmark from their very meticulous records. Um, so I think that was a very solid result there from Nordentoft in um, uh, Denmark. So that's all from me. Back to Nicola's going to talk briefly around the um, uh, NDIS policy in relation to Haven residences. Great, thanks, Laura. So um, we do know that um, a lot of NDIS participants identify, particularly those with a psychosocial disability, identify housing as the need. Um, so um, there are of all NDIS participants, about 18% have a psychosocial disability. Um, 36 of all of the participants with psychosocial, 36%, sorry, of all participants with psychosocial disability have where I live as a goal, uh, compared to 18% of other NDIS participants. Um, however, only 5% of NDIS participants have what they call supported independent living funding. Um, and of those, only 11% have uh, a psychosocial disability. So they actually did change the guidelines a couple of years ago to access supported independent living or SIL funding under the NDIS um, so that you needed um, eight hours of one-to-one or -one, intense one-to-one -one support within any 24-hour period to qualify for SIL funding, which, of course, counts most, most people with a psychosocial disability out because that is not the type of um, support that they need. So even though um, we know that this is a group of people who um, often struggle to maintain um, uh, stable housing, but we know from all the research that Laura's talked about and from our own experience that stable housing is of, often the absolute key to being able to maintain recovery. Um, uh, obviously, somebody said, what is still funding? It stands for supported independent love living and it's a stream of funding within the NDIS, um, but a stream of funding that it's quite difficult for people with a psychosocial disability to actually um, access. So there's a mismatch between, I guess, the needs of this uh, cohort of people and um, uh, how the NDIS recognises that. All right, um, next slide, I think, Laura. Um, so you would hopefully be aware that um, we, uh, you know, there's currently a big review of the NDIS being undertaken. So uh, we have pre um, prepared a fairly lengthy um, submission back to the review panel around how specifically housing and support for people with psychosocial disability. Um, I guess we're a little bit worried that uh, in typical fashion, psychosocial disability might be not given the focus that it should and the needs of people with psychosocial disability and particularly a, a focus around fluctuating levels of disability and the need to really um, uh, provide support that actually has kind of human rights and, um, and supporting independence right at the very heart of that support is very, very important. Um, so we are, are a bit worried, but some of the things that we've called for in terms of um, the reform process is to review the 
fulfil eligibility criteria to make sure that um, people with a psychosocial disability can get access to it again. We do think that there's, um, there's some need for um, a more intensive rehabilitation program for people who might not be on the NDIS but if they're given um, more intensive supports with housing for a more defined period of time, um, they never require it, um, the NDIS. So that is something that used to exist in Victoria is um, uh, psychosocial residential rehabilitation and it doesn't exist any, anymore. Some states have a little bit of a footprint in that area. There's Hassie in New South Wales, but we have also recommended that that model be um, supported and funded properly as separate to a model like the Haven, which is really about kind of longer term support. And there are some other recommendations here um, about funding the fixed uh, costs of shared supports. This is kind of a little bit technical about how you provide a model where people are pooling funding for shared supports when all of the funding is coming through individual packet, uh, packages for residents. Um, but it is what, one of the things that we have found uh, is it is quite important to uh, integrate the psycho, psychosocial supports um, with, with housing um, and that would probably need more capacity building supports in there as well to promote recovery. I might, not, I think I'll just leave it there. If people are interested in um, mine submission to the review, I'm, I'm really happy to share that. We are hopeful of um, influencing some change, but we are also aware we're a bit of a pimple on the pumpkin <laughs> in terms of um, the NDIS review, so um, we will be watching that space very carefully. I think that is it for me. Thank you. Thanks, Nicola. Right. And thanks, Laura, for a fantastic presentation and really lovely to see such tangible, practical uh, outcomes on the ground, some really positive outcomes um, for people coming through the service. We did just have a couple of questions. I think, thank you, Nicola. I see you've been answering as you go along. Um, 